Hello, I'm David Little. And I'm Jill Gittins. I'd like to welcome you all to our podcast number three. And this one is called The Threefold Vision. So, David, uh, what is this threefold vision and how does it apply to homeopathy? The threefold vision represents the philosophical side, the material medic and the repertory, and case management, which also involves posology. The earliest rendition of this theme is in the Medicine of Experience from 1805, five years before the first organon. This work is written in essay form rather than the aphorisms commonly found in the organon. Um, and Hahnemann's main point, why it's called the medicine of experience, is because it truly takes experience to practice the healing arts. You can't learn it from a book. You can't learn it from a podcast. <laughs> you have to learn it through practical experience, and slowly but surely it builds. So that's what we mean by medicine of experience. So Hahnemann published the medicine of experience in 1805, and this, con this contained the first complete template for homeopathy in all of its aspects. In the same year, he also published a work called the, commonly known as the Fragmenta, which you will not have read because it was written in Latin. And its full title means something like um, a partial study of the healing powers of medicines as proven on the healthy human body. It contained 27 remedies, proved either by Hahnemann or his associates. And this is one the first uh, homeopathic materia medica. And part of this book, it also contained a really large index, which was an early form of an attempt at a repertory. So in the same year, in 1805, he published all three aspects of study for homeopathy, the philosophy and vital principles and medicine of experience, and the fragmenta, which contained a whole homeopathic materia medica proved in the classic way, as well as his first attempt at an index or repertorium. There were 27 remedies? 27. 27. He proved 27 remedies and most likely he did it on himself. So these works were complementary works and we have other sets of complementary works too in homeopathy. Yeah, that, that pattern still went on for uh, his whole life in that the uh, Organon was published and then he published the Materia Medica Pura and at the same time he was developing his ideas of a repertory. This went on with the chronic disease in Boeinhausen's repertory of antisort. New edition of Organon, new edition of the chronic disease, some sort of attempt at perfecting the repertory and by 1817 he uh, had a handwritten 4,000 page repertory, is that right, John? Yes, over 4,000 pages. That was called the Symptom Lexicon. Okay. Now, Hahnemann starts his very wonderful essay, Medicine of Experience, <laughs> uh, in a very dramatic fashion. He begins by reminding us that human beings are more physically helpless than all other of the animals. Quote, Man, regarded as an animal, has been created more helpless than all other animals. He has no congenital weapons for his defence, like the bull, no speed to enable him to flee from his enemies like the deer, no wings, no webbed feet, no fins. The, this, this discussion that he wrote here is not, not written in a linear form. It's very much like prose or poetry. He does image after image after image. In fact, this whole discourse takes about four or five pages. And uh, it's really quite astounding. So he starts out by talking about uh, the first defense a human being has, and that's flight. And he said, even here, I mean, can we outrun a cheetah <laughs> that's chasing us? Can we outrun a pack of wolves? Not quite. Can we outswim an alligator? No, <laughs> not quite. So fleeing, the first defense is to run away and avoid the whole situation, is a challenge for uh, humanity. And uh, then the second point he takes up is about defense and fight. 
that we're not really equipped like the animals are to fight with our hands and our feet. We don't have claws, we don't have big teeth. We don't have the sting of viper, he said. What were some of the other things he talked yes, about? Yes, he said that, well, we don't have big weapons like horns and sharp teeth and rending claws. And uh, then he said we don't have anything like stings or poisons to defend ourselves with. And also, obviously, as he was saying, when it comes to flight, we don't run very fast, we don't swim very well, and we certainly can't fly. So, <laughs> so both the flight and the fight, we're pretty deficient. Yeah, he goes on and talks about exposure to the elements. And uh, I think one of the things he said is we don't have fur like a polar bear, or we don't have scales like a... I'm not sure what it was, but it was we don't have scales. Remember that one? Yes, the scales, things like beetles and, and things like that. Okay. Then another thing he brought up was how helpless... A human baby is compared to the other animals. Jill knows a bit about human babies, so maybe, <laughs> maybe yes. she can comment on that one. It's true that in nature, many animal babies are pretty independent from the beginning. They can stand up and walk around. They can do things for themselves, but a uh -huh. human baby is born totally helpless. It needs to be picked up and put to its mother's breast, even to survive. And uh, that makes them pretty helpless. They take a lot of care and looking after... <laughs> And also, the, he brought up the issue of food, that actually ready-made food, something that you could just eat, that it was fairly rare in nature compared f to the animals that were used to this kind of uh, specific diets, whereas humanity in the beginning wasn't that well prepared and had to really forage and hunt and scavenge and look and had a difficult time that we survived it all as a miracle of nature. So Hanuman goes on to say, after enumerating all these difficulties that human beings faced in nature, he says, However, the eternal source of all love endowed humanity with that spark of divinity and a mind that, indestructible itself, is capable of creating more powerful means for its sustenance, protection, defense and comfort than any of the most favored creatures can boast of having derived directly from nature. So this is an example of how human beings use their creative intelligence and their mind to improve their condition. An example of this is that they developed sophisticated tools and discovered the use of fire. Uh, this made a tremendous difference. This gave them warmth and protection against the cold, it gave them light and so, uh, at night so they could sit around, which was the beginnings of community life. Instead mm, of having to mm. huddle up and sleep and be scared of the dark and the animals, they could be around a fire, which would defend them against those animals and also give them a chance to sit around and communicate with each other, maybe sing, dance, talk, make things, mm, mm. a beginning of life. And also, one of the most important things about fire was it enabled human beings to cook food, which made their greatly widened their diet um, and it, it made oh. food more digestible and also safer to eat. Between fire and the food issue, that allowed humanity to spread out from the tropics and come out of Africa and travel all the way to the North Pole almost, <laughs> into Siberia. And uh, human beings have a tremendous ability to adapt to different environments because of their tools and their fire. There's some migratory animals that make long distances, like um, what monarch butterflies even. Uh, some of the birds, the whales, they move up and down great distances. But to really point out the species that has lived in more different environments than most species, and that's due to finally having some fire, some warmth, some cooked food, and some clothes. The naked ape doesn't do so well outside the tropics. Now, Hanuman noted what he called a mind that indestructible itself is capable of creating more powerful means. So, David, I feel that's a very important point. What would you like to say about the indestructible mind? The fact he said it was indestructible. I mean, obviously our bodies aren't indestructible, but he stated that it was the indestructible mind. And that brings us to the subject of consciousness. Um, 
which is an ancient study. In, in fact, uh, Anaxagoras in 500 BC in Athens postulated that there was nous, nous, the, the mind, the mental ability, perception, consciousness, awareness, and that all animals shared, uh, actually, uh, yeah, all animals shared this mind with the universal mind, and the universal mind was the, the fundamental basis of it all, and the other forms of consciousness are more emergent from that fundamental basis, in that plants, animals, minerals, all of nature channel the same mind, the same consciousness, but in different degrees due to their instruments. The, the, the mind itself, however, was eternal in itself, and that's a pretty amazing thing to say. Yes, in Aphorism 9 of the Organon, Hanuman refers and uses the term Geister, which you can translate as the indwelling rational spirit, to stand for the noetic faculty of the highest intelligence. This he speaks about in Aphorism 9, actually. He mentions this, the fact that we have this indwelling Geist, which can be defined as spirit, mind, intellect, basically words like that, the psyche itself. And um, we have to think about that because the brain itself, well, the brain is a funny organ and humanity depends on their brain. Some half of it is instinctive, half of it is volitional, in that the instinctive side sees what it needs to see to survive, really, to adapt, to have fitness. Uh, and uh, the reason-gifted mind is another aspect, the voluntary nervous system. I mean, the instinctive brain itself, when it looks at the universe, it sees something different than what you might call reality, in that we stand here, it seems like we're the center of the universe and the world is flat and the sun rises in the east and sets in, in the west and that the earth is the center of the universe and that the stars and sky are all spinning around the earth but the reason gifted mind looked at this and said, wait a minute, this is, this is actually an optical illusion. The sun doesn't rise in the east and the west. The earth is round, not flat. It rotates. And that makes the day and the night and makes the heavens rotate around the north star. It's all our perspective. So the reason gifted mind could figure out these things, while the instinctive mind, the brain actually limits reality so that you can survive and not be overwhelmed. And the reason gifted mind actually expands consciousness. So when we talk about reason, in some senses, this also includes certain forms of intuition or higher, higher reason, higher mind. So that's an important distinction between the instinctive and the voluntary, the automatic and the conscious choice. So unaided nature, it heals through crisis at the expense of tissues, humours and vitality. The homeopathic remedy aborts crisis and promotes lysis and vigour. The creative mind can help discover medicines that have a stronger effect on the human organism than unaided nature can supply. Through instinct, chimpanzees may know how to eat dozens of different herbs that will help them. But human beings can use their reason-gifted minds to develop a whole materia medica and use it to help others. And this theme is reflected in all the editions of the Organon. I, I think particularly in the fourth Organon, where Hahnemann wrote his first large introduction, he dealt with the, these subjects in detail, and he introduced the whole concept of the vital force in that term, vital force, in this work. And... Uh, he called it the automatic instinctive vital force. And it was a functional polarity from the r rational reason gifted mind. 
And this functional polarity sees things in a, in a complementary manner, but totally different, has a different perspective. So Hahnemann was always talking about instinct on the one hand and consciousness on the other hand. And that's all very interesting. An aided nature tries to heal through crisis. That is the processes of inflammation, infiltration, separation, necrosis. Nature is willing to sacrifice the part to save the whole. Now, for example, if a cat or a dog or an animal in nature gets a splinter in their paw that they can't get out, then nature will put them through those processes and they may or may not actually survive it. The vet, of course, using his human ingenuity, would try to remove that splinter with uh, his fingers. If that didn't work, she might use uh, tweezers. If that doesn't work, she may or he may have to make an insertion, of, incision of some type in order to try to get it out. So many times this is easy, many times it's hard. Sometimes things are embedded so far that it really would take an incision to get them out. And that brings with it certain inherent dangers, such as the risk of infection, etc. So if the infection spreads systemically, it can even threaten the entire system, the, the person themselves. And they need antibiotics, which of course has their own inherent problems, etc., and on it goes. Now, the homeopath, however, may have some different tools. For example, I've seen many splinters that were embedded too deep to get out with a probe. That would have really taken, taken them to the surgeon. Instead, giving a remedy such a simple thing as silica 6X, which is known to remove foreign objects, many times I've seen it stop the inflammation, stop the infiltration, stop the separation, prevent the necrosis, and actually eject the splinter without any pus without any pain, without any redness. It just pop out and there's an empty hole. As you can see where the splinter was and it's completely clean. And I've seen this many times with splinters in some other foreign objects. Yes, silica uh, can do the most amazing work because these situations are quite troublesome. Um, if you can't get the thing out, the foreign object, the splinter, whatever it is, then you're in trouble. And you give silica, I remember one case, was a little chap, about two and a half years old, running around on some rough ground, took a skid on his stomach, and afterwards he had all these little bits of gravel uh, and yeah, rocks yeah, yeah, actually was, embedded in, his, in the skin of his stomach. Yeah, it actually uh, fell running on a road, and it was gravel, small pieces of gravel mm. embedded in the umbilical areas. So this looked pretty bad and we didn't know what to do because first they're going to get infected and then we're going to have to take him to have them cut out under anaesthetic and take antibiotics. It's very difficult. So we just gave the amazing silica 6X. And the and homeopathic surgeon. Yes, it really is. And without any trouble or pain or fuss, that overnight, the next day, all there were were some little clean holes and... The little bits of gravel had popped out, and what was left was just completely clean, just a nice tiny little hole, no pus, no infection, nothing, and it just healed up perfectly. This is a quote from the Medicine of Experience, which introduces the three knowledges which are essential to homeopathic studies. The threefold nature of phenomena is often symbolized by a triangle. For example, this is seen in the neutron, proton, and electron of an atom. This trinity can also be found in the organon, the materia medica, and the repertory. The physical organism, the instinct of autonomic vital force, and the reason-gifted mind, and Hahnemann's three miasms, his originals, sora, psychosis, and syphilis. The threefold vision also represents the trinity of studies found in the medicine of experience. So this is Introduction of the Three Knowledges. The quote reads... Medicine is a science of experience. Its object is to eradicate diseases by means of remedies. The knowledge of diseases, the knowledge of remedies, 
and the knowledge of their employment constitute medicine. Now this theme is contained in aphorism 3 of every edition of the Organon and it offers insight into the structure of the text of all the editions. For example, in the sixth edition, it is divided up in the following manner. Knowledge of diseases is contained in aphorisms 1 to 104. Knowledge of medicines, aphorism 105 to 145. And knowledge of the application of medicines to diseases Aphorisms 146 to 291. So our second chart that we see here is called the three types of knowledge. And this is taken from the Homeopathic Compendium. It's volume one, chapter two, page 65. And this chart is inspired by Hahnemann's Medicine of Experience and it lays out the information in that work uh, in the form of a chart which covers all the important aspects of the homeopathic paradigm. Now we see on the left the first column is knowledge of diseases and the first box you see underneath that is that you will need to know the causes if possible to be able to note the symptoms and the circumstances. Causation is the first subject and we've been over it quite a bit Hahnemann spoke of the difficulty of finding the cause in the mysterious internal regions of the organism. And some people today might say, well, he didn't have all the scans and didn't have uh, all the uh, um, laboratory tests. I mean, it would be very difficult for him to know the cause of disease, but we're so much more advanced now. That sounds like an irrelevant statement to me. Someone might say something like that. But even today, modern te with modern technology, there's a great discrepancy between the proposed cause of a disease and what actually shows up in the laboratory. And this, this becomes very clear in a study that was done and published on PubMed. The name of the study was Discrepancies Between Clinical and Autopsy Diagnosis and the Valium of Postmortem Histology, a Meta-Analysis and Review, and as I said, from PubMed.government, which is under the auspices of the National Institute of Health. So this is serious research. And here's what they came up with. At least 33% of death certificates are found to be incorrect by autopsy. Okay, so one-third of death certificates, the cause of death that's written down, are incorrect. That's the essence of it. 50% of autopsies produce unexpected findings. So, how much better is that? It's not easy. It's not easy for us to know the cause. It's not easy for the allopaths to know their cause. In some senses, because of our sophisticated coverage of the symptoms themselves, we have a deeper understanding of potential causes than can come from the scans and the lab. The second issue is symptoms. Well, we've been over this many times. The actual signs and symptoms are the mistuning of the vital force. That's the main point. The symptoms themselves are a sign that shows that an internal disharmony. And through recording the totality of the symptoms, one can understand the very gestalt of the disease, knowing all of its aspects and all of its angles. And although we may not know the exact cause, if there is one, we can still cure the disease through the totality of the symptoms. The third point is circumstances. So this, this includes things like the attendant circumstances, like constitution, temperament, occupation, lifestyle, habits, relationship, age, and sexual function. A complete case history is a recording of the totality of the causes, signs, and symptoms, as well as the attendant circumstances of the disease. Now the next box here says multiple causes, individual disease. 
which Hanuman was differentiating from diseases that were collective. So in this case, we have individual disease, which has many causes. Individual disease is based on the ideological constitution. That is a multitude of potential causes. Hanuman wrote that one can make a tremendous amount of words up from the letters A to Z, but even more incalculable than that is the innumerable diseases that one might find in the human or any animal's organism. And yes, I'd just like to add here that it doesn't matter how many cases you take, mm. how many cases have been taken homeopathically, even ones to which have received the same remedy, that no two of those are the same, even though there might be some overlapping symptoms. When you look at them, no two people, no two cases, no two sets of rubrics actually are the same. There are always elements in one that are not present in others. How many times in the last 50 years have I given Ignatian that myrrh? Many times. Were, the, were those patients identical? Did they have identical constitutions, temperaments? No. It's not identical. It's similars. It's similars. So the idea of giving a similar remedy by individualization means that even the same remedy has so many different aspects that every individual Ignatia case or every individual Natmer case is actually similar to the others, but certainly not the same. So then we move on to the next box, which is collective miasms, which have a single common cause. Collective diseases are composed of common causes and similar symptoms. This is an interesting subject, and as early as 1805, Hahnemann was already talking about miasms. He talked about acute miasms, he talked about chronic miasms, even half-acute miasms. He hadn't developed those classifications in this discourse, but he mentioned several different kinds of diseases, such as whooping cough and... Uh, um, plague. <laughs> yeah, plague. Fevers. Kinds of fevers. And a few chronic miasms, like he already talked about syphilis and psychosis. So that early he was already studying collective diseases and the miasms. Collective diseases, however, do not mean identical patients. It means similar patients in that you have an overall picture of the miasms and they will express the, the generals of the miasm itself, but they will all have individual constitutional concomitants that makes them different than all other persons suffering from the same miasm. That's the meaning of the collective and the individual in many ways. For example, uh, in sources of common materia medica, or examinations of the common materia medica, sources. Yeah. Here's the, in examination and sources of the common materia medica, 1817. Thank you. Um, he mentions four things that have common cause and similar symptoms. He mentions physical inner injury and arnica. The cause is so strong, somebody has fallen. Fall weed, it's folk name, so somebody takes a big fall. Most of those people, at least originally, will reflect the symptoms of arnica, and arnica becomes a nion specific for falls. Another thing he mentioned, which was quite interesting, was endemic nutritional disorders. He talked about certain areas where they were so depleted in iodine that everyone would come up with iodine deficiency gouters and that spongia often was the remedy that acted on a group of people suffering from the same nutritional deficiency. He also talked about environmental disorders. I think it was swamps and marshlands and China. He wasn't necessarily speaking just about malaria, but about the environment itself that produced malaria mosquitoes. And of course, the chronic miasms, the acute miasms, and the half-acute miasms, which, as I said, weren't really differentiated at this time. And that pretty much sums up causes, symptoms, and circumstances, and multiple causes and individual diseases, and diseases of common cause and collective miasms. So now we move on to the central column. This one is the knowledge of medicine. So what do we need to know about this? First of all, the homeopathic knowledge of medicines is done by provings. 
The Materia Medica is based on proving of remedies on the healthy. And this is very unique, although it's not just with homeopathy. It didn't originate in homeopathy. In fact, it's 3000 BC in China, the Emperor Shen Nu. He was famous for eating different remedies. In fact, it's said that he and his court proved 365 remedies. And then in the end, the great emperor himself, who was depicted wearing leaves and branches as, as clothes, turned green and died because he had proved so many medicines and so many poisons <laughs> in his lifetime. But it became the root of the Chinese Materia Medica. So Hahnemann wasn't the first to develop provings, but it was rare indeed in the modern times. So, provings. And also, in Medicine of Experience, Hahnemann mentions an in interesting thing. The same way you study the totality of the symptoms of a patient, he said you studied the totality of the symptoms of a medicine, and that the same kind of data that you recorded when trying to diagnose which remedy was necessary could be used in the provings to record the symptoms of that medicine for further reference in the clinic. And that's really quite interesting, too. Right, so then we move on to the fact that all medicines are dynamic. In fact, in the homeopathic view, everything is dynamic, and that should be remembered at all times. So we went over dynamics pretty heavily. I'll review it here. It is essential to understand the dynamic nature of phenomena, as seen in the human basin, the disease basin and the remedy basin, that all these are dynamic activities. They're not merely chemical, they're not merely mechanical, but they're dynamic in, in nature, in the way that the tides are affected by the moon, gravity affects falling objects. There's nothing you can see, there's no mechanical lever there. It's dynamic in nature, as dynamic as the atom is now proven to be. So dynamics are very important, and we've talked about the dynamic nature of, of uh, homeopathy and homeopathic remedies, for it's a dynamic medicinal disease that overtunes the natural diseases and causes the dynamic secondary reaction of the living vital force that brings the remedy, uh, brings the cure to completion. Okay, now the third point here, one very important homeopathy, is that the medicine is given in very small doses and that remedies are potentized. This is a really important point. Uh, for example, similars without the checks and balances can be quite dangerous actually. I mean many of them are, are over poisons. But when they're potentized and dimetized, then they become completely safe and harmless if you use the checks and balances. So one of the biggest checks and balances on the use of similars is using a potentized remedy, where the remedy is purely dynamic and any physical residue has been removed, although they still show in uh, tests to have nanoparticles beyond Avogadro's number. And at this time, Hahnemann was already using potencies that were the equivalent of 3C, 6C, 9C, 12C, 15C, so he was already beyond Avogadro's number as early as 1805, although we hadn't worked out the, uh, the centesimal system as we understand it today. It was early days yet, but he was already talking about the millionth or trillionth of a part of a medicine. Okay. And uh, then we also have here the idea of the size and the dose and the potency. This is a, still sometimes misunderstood. In the beginning, even Hahnemann himself hadn't really separated the, the size of the dose from the potency factor. And uh, people today, some, some people believe that the minimal dose means the tiny amount in the potency, when actually the size of the dose and the potency are two different aspects of posology that are extremely important in fine-tuning the remedy. So, I think we can go on to the third column. Right. Now, this is the knowledge of how to apply the medicines to the individual cases of disease. And the first point, again, a central core of homeopathy, is the use of similar remedies. Similar remedies. I think I preempted this a little bit. So, when we talk about similar remedies, we're talking about the primary action of the remedial disease, the remedy, 
and how it overtunes and replaces or cancels the natural disease because of its superior power due to potency. That's what the dynamic nature makes it superior to natural disease, more powerful than natural disease, but not as dangerous as natural disease. And that's one of the miracles of homeopathy. So that is how similar remedies work. And Hahnemann noticed even early on that there was a slight aggravation. And at first he thought, well, this is simply the fact that there's still some substance in here. I better dilute this further and further yet so that there's no uh, toxic effects from a remedy like arsenicum, for example. So he kept diluting the remedies down and he began to notice that actually instead of becoming weaker, they were becoming stronger as he diluted them. And uh, this led to the slight aggravation, and now he realized that that was a dynamic ag aggravation. It had nothing to do with the physical attributes of the remedy. That it was the remedy overtuning the natural disease, replacing the sensation of the remedy in the vital force, stimulating a curative secondary reaction, which brought the organism back to homeostasis. This is called the action-reaction model of cure. I think I've covered that. Did I miss anything there? No, we have gone all the way through that. And as you'll see, since everything is in threes in this episode, that we have three columns with three points. So we have lots and lots of triangles. Now I'm going to read uh, a very nice uh, paragraph that David wrote for the end of this. This completes the introduction of the threads that make up the foundation of homeopathy. For example, we've looked at the human vison as manifested in the human mind-body complex. The instinctive vital force as energy and vitality and the living organism as a unity in diversity. This dynamic trinity forms a gestalt in which the whole is more than the sum of its parts. We discussed the nature of causation and individual and collective diseases and reviewed the processes of cure versus the processes of suppression and palliation. We also spoke about the minimal dose and the use of potentized remedies. <laughs> Lastly, we emphasized checks and balances oh my. that make homeopathy a safe and gentle system. Now. I know that David has a few more things to say about this. Medicine of experience. Experience, that's the key word here. For the first five years of study, you're literally learning your basics. You may think you understand, but you don't really have the experience to understand yet. Perhaps even over the next five years, you find out where you're weak and strong, depending on your experience of what worked best and what didn't work best. And as you're going, you're learning and learning. You can't learn it just from a textbook. You can't learn it just from a lecture or a podcast. You can only really learn through experience. It's an empirical art. And it's based on theory. And from the theory comes a hypothesis, but then comes the trial. And that runs by trial, success, error, and success, hopefully, in the end. So, I myself, in these podcasts, have found myself reading The Organon of Medicine for the umpteenth time. Starting right out with the introduction, going to Aphorism 1, which is the ethics and knowledge needed, flowing through Aphorism 2, which talks about a safe, rapid, and gentle cure, flowing into Aphorism 3 that talks about the nature of disease, the nature of medicines, and their employment. And that's the threefold vision. Hahnemann actually compressed a tremendous amount of information into those aphorisms. And you really have to unpack them, like unpacking a zip file. Because there's so much in these aphorisms that I'm seeing it fresh. For the, I don't know how many times I've read the Organon anymore, but I know I've read it many times, 
And every time I read it, new information from that same data package opens up and I see things I just didn't see before. And that's happening to me now and I'm very happy to be going through it again. And uh, I think that's about all I have to say in my closing. Uh, we wish you all the best and Jill's going to talk us out. Right. Everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found some food for thought and reflection. If you like our channel, please like and subscribe and hit the notification icon so you can keep updated with our podcasts. If you're interested in finding out more about the Homeopathic Compendium, please visit our website, friendsforhealth.com. We'd be very happy to hear from you, uh, so please leave a comment on the video. And the links are all in the description. So that's all for now, everyone. I'll see you for the next podcast. And bye-bye for now. Oh, thank you very much.